Hi everybody. Today we're going to talk a little more about vector spaces and in particular we're going to be talking about vector subspaces. Now let's start off by just spending a couple of minutes reviewing what we did last time. So you'll remember that we started off last time uh, by working with the theorem that we had proved earlier in the course about Rn and the two operations in Rn of vector addition, scale, and multiplication. And that theorem that we proved some time ago was this theorem here. We showed that those two operations satisfy these eight properties. Now, before moving on to that, to the elevation of this into a definition like we did last time, let me say a couple of things about uh, this theorem that I think are important that I didn't mention last time. Uh, or I kind of mentioned in passing, maybe. And that's that, that uh, this theorem is just about these two operations in Rn, and in particular, to prove each of these eight properties, number one, it was easy, but that's not my point here. Number two, each, each one of these properties, when we proved it, all we needed to use to prove one of the properties was the definition of vector addition and the definition of scalar multiplication. For example, we didn't need any additional features of Rn or of Euclidean space. We didn't need anything about a dot product. We didn't need anything about a norm. Um, none of those things that we noted earlier on are things that we use in Rn, and that actually those are the things that make Rn into, quote, Euclidean space. We didn't use any of that in proving this theorem. This theorem came from just the definitions of vector addition and scalar multiplication and nothing else. That's important. And that's what enabled us then to say, hey, there are going to be a lot of other situations where we have two operations. Maybe norm and dot product don't even have any meaning, but there will be those two operations that work like vector addition, scalar and multiplication, and Rn. And if we can show in these new situations with some set V and its operations that the operations, again, satisfy V1 to V8, then we will have, uh, we will have we can then prove results about uh, vector spaces, and those proofs will use nothing but V1 to V8, and then we'll have, let's say, a kind of a catalog of theorems or results about vector spaces in general, and then whenever we encounter uh, a new vector, a new situation that we can model as a vector space, we can use this kind of catalog of results that we've already proved about vector spaces, not just about Rn, not just about R infinity, not just about the set of functions f of x, but about vector spaces in general. So that's the reason that this elevating that theorem to this definition is so powerful. And so useful. And of course, it goes hand in hand with the fact that we are indeed going to see lots of vector spaces. So we'll have lots of opportunity for using this kind of catalog of results that we could develop for, for vector spaces. So with that kind of little review of what we did uh, last time, let's now look at another example of a vector space. And this example is actually good, uh, a good example for right at this point in the course uh, because of two things. And because it does the two things that I mentioned uh, uh, of importance about this definition. Number one, this example is itself going to provide a whole bunch of vector spaces, lots of new vector spaces. And number two, it is going to motivate some theorems that work for the example, but that we can also use, uh, put it in a different way, we can also prove not just for the example, 
but for vector spaces in general. So this example is going to motivate theorems about vector spaces. So I'm going to start with the example over here. And so the example is going to be a system of homogeneous linear equations. So let's write our equations here. We have A11x1 plus out to A1n xn, and it's a homogeneous equation, so equals zero, and it's linear, and so we have a whole system of linear equations. In particular, we have m equations They're all homogeneous equations. They all have zero on the right-hand side, and they're all linear, as you can see, and there's m of them. And, of course, we can write this system more succinctly or more concisely in sort of matrix vector form as just a x is the zero vector, where, of course, a is the m by n matrix of the a's, of the coefficients in the linear equations, and x is a vector, variable vector, if you like, in Rn, because there's n components, n variables, and of course, we maybe also want to point out that uh, the right-hand side is the zero vector in Rm, because if a is an m by n matrix, it takes any vector in Rn and turns it into or maps it into a vector in Rm. So this is our typical, general, uh, homogeneous system of homogeneous linear equations, and that's that same system written more succinctly. And so what we're going to be interested in here is the set of solutions to this system of linear equations. That is, the set of solutions of this matrix vector equation, and so let's write that up here. I'm going to call that set of solutions S, for set or, or solutions. S is the set of vectors in Rn such that Ax is the zero vector. And that, of course, is the set of solutions uh, of our equation system. Uh, now let's, uh, let's see what the set S looks like in several instances, in several examples with different M's and different N's. So let's do that over here. We'll take off the, the definition. And uh, let's first see what S, the set S, will look like if n is 2, so we have two variables, and uh, we have only one equation. So that's going to look like this, where we are in 2 space, in R2. The equation is going to be A11x1 plus A12, sorry, A1x1 plus A2x2, we don't need a double subscript with one equation, uh, equals 0. And the set S, the set of solutions to that single equation, is going to be a line in R2, a line through the origin, because the zero vector, 0, 0, is clearly a solution of that linear equation, a1x1 plus a2x2 equals 0. Uh, and then what if we're in R2, but m is 2? We have a two-equation system. So now we our set of solutions is a set of solutions, simultaneous solutions, you could say, to the two equations. So we're going to have each equation is going to be a line through the origin, and the set of solutions will be the set of things that are, set of vectors that are on both lines, and of course that's going to be the singleton set that's just the origin. So that would be S in this n equals 2, m equals 2 case. And then what about the case n, I'm sorry, n equals 3. So we're now in 3 space, x1, x2, x3 are our vectors. And uh, if we have a single equation, m is 1, then s, the set of solutions, is going to be a plane in uh, R3 through the origin again. And if we have two equations, m is 2, we're going to have two planes. 
and the set of solutions will be the set of vectors that's on both of the two planes, that is the intersection of the two planes. So that'll be a line, again, through the origin. Um, and so you'll just notice then that in each case, we got something that was linear, visually, from linear functions, and that the, the set S uh, always seem to include the origin. So that turns out maybe that's going to be something kind of general. And so, uh, so that gives us some visual idea, geometrical idea of what the set S is going to look like. And so now what, uh, what I want to do is I maintain that this set S is a vector space. So let's write that down. I say S is a vector space. Well, I say it's a vector space. Is it? Let's see. Is it a vector space? Well, let's try to see how we can go about finding out. Okay, so let's do this here. And we're going to use this space down here. So uh, I'm going to take a moment to uh, erase this off the screen, and then uh, I'll be back, and we'll use this space to try to see if we can answer this question. Is it a vector space? So uh, take a moment to take this off and be right back. Okay, we've uh, got a little more screen real estate here to work with now, and I've also brought back our, uh, our definition of a vector space, uh, which we're going to need uh, if we're going to try to check whether S is actually a vector space. How am I going to, going to go about that? I mean, if I maintain that it's a vector space, how am I going to verify my claim? I'm going to have to do that by verifying that S satisfies V1 to V8. And of course, I really mean by that S with two operations, addition and scalar multiplication, defined on S. So that means I need to have two operations that are going to be functions from S cross S into S and R cross S, scalars and vectors, into S. And so I need to verify, I need to verify that I actually have two functions that do this and I have to verify that those functions, those operations, satisfy V1 to V8. So, of course, S is a subset of Rn. All its vectors are in Rn, of course. And so, uh, since uh, we already have um, vector addition and scalar multiplication defined in Rn, and in fact, for this, let me put the theorem back on the screen here about Rn. We already have these two operations defined in Rn, so of course I can replace S on the left-hand side here, here, and here with uh, uh, Rn, and we know that we have operations defined here, and of course, they map into Rn. So it's, of course, obviously the case then that since the operations are defined in Rn, and S is a subset of Rn, and in fact, let me even uh, put this in, let me highlight this, because that's going to turn out to be itself an important point here. The fact that S is a subset of Rn means that these operations that are defined fine in Rn, they're defined in S too because S is a subset of Rn. They're defined for all vectors in Rn, in particular vectors in, in S. But of course the problem here is that they result in vectors in Rn, and we have to show that what we get when we add two vectors in S is not a vector in Rn. Well, we get a vector in Rn all right, but not just any old vector in Rn. We need to show that we get a vector that's actually in S. So that's 
one of the first things we're going to have to do is to show that we get something in S. And in fact, um, uh, let's go to the let's go back to the definition of a vector space and notice here that what we're doing is we're saying we've got operations, vector addition, scalar multiplication, and you'll notice that actually V1 and V2 here, uh, I hadn't said this before, but V1 and V2 uh, appear to be kind of a little redundant because if we actually have uh, an operation plus vector addition that takes vectors in the domain V cross V and maps into V, then of course V1 is, is satisfied. And similarly, for the star notation, V2 is satisfied. So what we really mean by V1 and V2 here is that if we want to establish that we have a vector space, V, with these two operations, V1 and V2 say we have to establish that indeed the plus vector addition operation does map into V, that, that we do get a vector in V. And we have to establish that the star uh, operation, the scalar multiplication operation, does indeed give us a vector in, in V, does give us a vector. And so that's what V1 and V2 are, and that's what we have to do here. So we have to establish that, in fact, we, we get vectors in, um, in S. So let's take this off first off, first of all. Let's take that off, and let's leave that on there for a moment, and let's start trying to establish V1 through V8, V1 through V8, to establish this is a vector space. So V1, I have to show that if X is in S and Y is in S, that implies that X plus Y is in S. That's V1. I mean, here it says for every X and Y in V. Another way of saying that, as we've seen or, or earlier, is we could say that is X in S and Y in S implies X plus Y is in S. And so uh, X in S says X is in S. It's a solution to the equation system. If Y is in S, it's a solution of the equation system. So from having x and y both in s, I have ax equals the origin, ay equals the origin, and that, of course, implies that ax plus ay is 0 plus 0, 0 vector plus the 0 vector, which is the origin, the 0 vector, and of course, this gives us a times x plus y is the zero vector. That is, x plus y is a solution of our equation system, so x plus y is in S. So there we've established V1. How about V2? It goes just the same. Here, I'll do it a little more quickly. Here, we want to show that lambda in R and x in S implies lambda x is in S. And of course, um, this x in s says that a x is the zero vector. That's what it means to be in s. And therefore, we have we have um, lambda times a x. If a x is the zero vector, we've got lambda times the zero vector. That's the zero vector. Therefore, a lambda x is the zero vector. In other words, lambda, make sure that looks like a lambda there. That's a kind of a funny lambda. a times lambda x is the zero vector, so lambda x is a solution of our equation system. So we've said if x is an s, Lambda x is an S. So we've satisfied V2, we've satisfied V1. What about uh, some of the other properties? Turns out that V3 through V6, those are really automatic because once we know that the operations are actually well-defined and we do indeed get something in S, 
so that now I can take this off. While it's true, that's not the thing that we really want. This is what we want. So once we have that, V3 through V6 are all automatic. And they're automatic because we already know that they're satisfied for vector addition and scalar multiplication in Rn. So of course, they're going to be satisfied for if we just draw our vectors from S, as long as the operations are well defined for those vectors, as we've just established they are. So these are all OK from pi, pi, <laughs> plus, and, and the star operation on Rn, and S is a subset of Rn. And then what about V7 and V8? Uh, V7, well here, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to Rn. V7 says that we, in Rn, we actually have a vector x hat here, um, which is an additive identity. If we add it to any other vector, we get that vector back. And so it happens that that x hat in Rn is the zero vector. So um, we have, uh, we actually do have that uh, we need to show that, uh, we need to show that the zero vector is in uh, S, but of course the zero vector is in S because it's a solution to our equation system as we already pointed out in these geometrical examples. So we do have A of zero equals zero. And so uh, we do have an additive identity. It is the case that zero plus x equals x for all x in, uh, in S because it's true for all x in Rn. So we've established V7, we've established these, and V8. Uh, V8 says that for all x in S, we have minus x in S because then we can add x and minus x and get back the zero vector. And of course, it is the case that if ax is the zero vector, if x is a solution of our system, then it is the case that a times minus x is the zero vector. So minus x is a solution to our equation system too. So indeed, it was pretty easy to establish all eight of our properties for the set S of solutions of our equation system. So what that tells us then is that um, we basically have a kind of theorem. And it tells us that for any M and any N, for any, any N, so Rn for any N, and any number of equations, if we have an M by N matrix and a set of solutions to the corresponding system of homogeneous linear equations will be a vector space. So, as I pointed out before doing the example, this example provides lots of vector spaces because every M by N matrix, all the different M by N matrix matrices provide different uh, sets S, and they're all vector spaces. In fact, I could even have uh, one, uh, I could even have uh, different numbers of equations. The, the, could vary the m's and fix the n. And I would still have a whole bunch of vector spaces that are all subsets of Rn. Notice I've highlighted this. All of these are subsets of Rn. So, it happens, perhaps not surprisingly, that this again is a situation that's going to occur all the time where we're going to have a vector space. And of course, in general, the vector space will be just, we'll use just a general, a generic V to represent the vector space. It's going to happen all the time that we find ourselves with subsets or a subset of a vector space. And the operations from the vector space, of course, 
those operations hold in S and be situations where we can verify that those operations actually map back into S so that V1 and V2 are satisfied and all the other properties are satisfied too. So we'll have a vector space that's a subset of our, if you like, our parent vector space. And so since that's going to happen a lot, what do you think we're going to do? We're going to elevate this idea to a definition. So here we have a definition of a vector subspace. And a vector subspace is the thing that we just described. If we have a vector space V and we have a subset of that vector space that is itself a vector space in its own right, as our sets were here, then we call that uh, a vector subspace of the parent vector space, of the space V. And of course, notice that we've said if the set S, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a vector space, if we are using the operations that from the parent vector space, if we're using the operations from V, I'll refer to those as the, the V operations, okay? So in this case, those were a vector addition, scalar multiplication in Rn. So now that we have uh, our definition of a vector subspace, uh, and we are going to have lots of situations with vector subspaces, there are two things that uh, we want to do here. First, we want to give some additional examples beyond this one of vector subspaces, not in Rn necessarily, but in perhaps other kinds of vector spaces. That's the one thing we want to do. And the other thing we want to do is we want to see if we can find e conditions that will make it easier to verify when I do have, or it may be easier to check whether when I have a subset of a vector space, to check whether that is a vector subspace, a vector space in its own right, or not. Now, I say we want conditions to make it easier because that was a little bit tedious here. I mean, it wasn't a big deal, but it was a little tedious to have to go through all the properties V1 to V8 and show every one of them. It would be a lot better if we had some kind of simpler, smaller set of conditions that we could check to see whether some given subset of V, of a vector space, is itself a vector space and therefore a vector subspace. And so let's take this off and we'll do a little example to show that we really, that, that's something we really do have to do. And then we will start out by actually uh, finding these simpler conditions and then we'll give a couple or three more examples of vector subspaces. So let's take this off and then we'll be right back and, uh, and we'll move forward.